One of the things that we really prioritize is the preaching of the Word of God and the teaching of the Word of God to children downstairs. And coming out of the Word of God, we love, we love the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, we believe in it with all of our hearts. That is our, our hope and our foundation for our life and for our eternity is it's resting in Jesus. And last week we had a wonderful Easter celebration, both Good Friday and on Sunday, reflecting, remembering, rejoicing in what Jesus has done for us. And I hope and trust, People's Church, that we haven't lost that this week. Maybe your busyness kind of crowded some of that out, but we want to be a church that is kind of like Easter every week, right? That we are so focused on the gospel the death and resurrection for Jesus, that we never lose sight of that. It stays fresh and exciting and passionate. So let's make that our, our goal even this morning as we worship together. Um, we express ourselves as a church in a variety of ways. Our primary focus is here Sunday morning, gathering together from a variety of communities. But we also have small groups that are spread around the region and we'll be wrapping those up soon, but we uh, will enjoy those for another week or two for some of us. Uh, we also have other regular events that happen as we try to live out what it means to be a church together. And so on Tuesdays in the mornings, we have a mom and taught play group. Uh, they gather for fellowship and just to encourage each other as new moms or maybe not so new moms for some. On Wednesdays, there's a men's prayer that gathers at 10 o'clock in the morning here. And we have been going through a series called Grief Share, helping people cope with their grief. I believe that wraps up this Wednesday at 7. And then also on 7, sorry, also on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. is our young adults, our 14 6, and they meet at Valley Elementary for activities and study of God's Word and good fellowship. And then on Thursdays at 6.30 in the evening, here at the church, our teenagers meet every week for youth group. And again, it's a fun time. It's a, a good Bible study, small groups. So we are fellowshipping together, pointing each other to Jesus regularly. Some special events that are happening uh, in the next little bit. Uh, don't forget, members, that we do have an annual business meeting right after the service. I think there'll be a five or 10 minute break where you can grab a coffee and then we'll call you back in to uh, welcome some new members and do our annual business for the year. And so please remember that as you get up to go that we need to uh, come right back in. I've also been asked to announce that uh, ladies who signed up for the meal down in HRM and uh, the special movie outing that you are to gather right up here, right after the service for the business meeting, just to kind of talk over things because you have a few things to get organized before you head out this afternoon. I think those are the major announcements that we have, but again, welcome. Uh, we do have nursery going on for uh, young children and babies upstairs. Uh, the children will leave partway through the service. We worship together through song, and then the kids go downstairs in a bit to learn. So if you have children, uh, we would encourage you, if that's something you're comfortable with, to send them down as we go. Well, let's stand together, and our worship team are going to lead us to point our minds and hearts towards Jesus through song.
ask Ed McGregor to come forward and, and do a congregational prayer for us. Thanks, Ed. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we just bow in your presence this morning, Lord. Thank you for the song that's being sung already. Our worship is not just about praise and, and songs, Lord. Our worship is about the Word of God, who trains, transfers lives over to hope and joy. And I pray, Heavenly Father, for anyone that walked through the door who may not know this joy of knowing you, that, that your Holy Spirit will convict and draw them to you. For those that do know you, Lord, may you draw them to yourself. I just pray, Heavenly Father, with all my heart, you would just bless our congregation. Bless the pastor as he brings forth the word. May we walk away encouraged, knowing we've been with you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, man. 
Last week we had the opportunity to celebrate Easter, where Jesus gave his all for us, coming down to earth, to a sinful and broken world, to die on a cross, to take our punishment, and then rising again on the third day to conquer death. Um, And our natural response to this should be to surrender all and to put our full trust in him. Matthew 16, 24 and 25 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever desires to save his life. Be my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasure. you to do something different this morning. Would you stand, please, and find somebody that you haven't said hello to yet today and greet them, please.
This, this front right-hand corner kind of went to the extreme, didn't they? Stop being so friendly, please. Good to see you all. Welcome to the service this morning. I hope you've been blessed by and enjoyed the ministry of music, the great words and the melodies and the fellowship in singing it together so far. Now we have opportunity, if you know and love the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior, I hope that you've picked up one of these little communion cups that we might be able to celebrate communion together. Easter's been mentioned several times. In preparation for Easter and in preparation for our uh, service with Crossroads and with Faith, Faith Baptist in Great Village, I was reading a number of commentaries and messages on Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2, and we shared from verse 2, the three churches and three pastors shared. But I want to come back to something that I picked up. I shared it with someone else, and they didn't use it, so this morning I get to use it. I confess it's not my own. It's just something I've found the Lord's given from another brother, and I've truly appreciated it. So let me read for you Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. It says, Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God has sat down. I read these words on Good Friday. I thought they expressed beautifully something that I would like to call the danger of the contemporary cross. The danger of the contemporary cross. Let me read for you. The cross in the ears of the people of Athens, of Corinth, of Rome, That cross excited deeper disgust than the word gallows would today. For that cross was regarded as the appropriate punishment of the most infamous of mankind. We can now scarcely appreciate these feelings. And so, of course, the declaration that Jesus endured the cross and despised the shame it does not make the appropriate impact or impression on our minds in regards to the nature of his sufferings, the value of his example. When we think of the cross, we don't think of the multitude of slaves, robbers, thieves, and rebels who died on it, but we think of one great victim. Because of his death there, Somehow in our minds, the cross is dignified, even ennobled. This instrument of torture in our minds is now circled with a halo of glory. We've been accustomed to read of it as an imperial standard of war in the days of Constantine, as a banner under which armies have marched to conquest. The cross is mingled with the sweetest poetry, a sacred thing in magnificent cathedrals. It adorns altars. It's even an object of adoration. It is in the most elegant of engravings. It's worn by beauty and piety as an ornament near the heart. It is associated with all that is pure in love, great in self-sacrifice, holy in religion. But to see the true force of the expression that our Savior endured the cross. It is today necessary for us to divest or strip ourselves of these ideas of glory which encircle the contemporary cross and to place ourselves in that time, in that land in which the most infinite, infamous of mankind were stretched upon a cross it was regarded for such men an appropriate mode of punishment. And that infamy, that atrocity, that shame, outrage, that disgrace, Jesus, the Savior, was willing to bear. 
and the strength of his confidence in God, his love for man and the depth of his humiliation was shown in his readiness and firmness to stride forward toward such a death. He endured the cross. We come this morning to these emblems. And these emblems include the cross because they speak to us of the one who suffered and died there. And so in the first portion of this, It is our sacred responsibility to think of and remember the death, the broken body of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to think of him as we partake of this. And in the breaking of his body, there was indeed the shedding of his blood, And it was the shedding of his blood, the death of the Savior, that paid for our sins and purchased our redemption. And so again, as we drink of it, we think of him. Thank you, our Father, for our Savior. Thank you for what he endured on Calvary's cross. Indeed, thank you for the cross. But the only significance of those two sticks of wood is the one who hung upon it that day thank you for the Lord Jesus that he died was buried and rose from the dead and lives today at the father's right hand to be our savior we thank you in Jesus name amen And now it's our opportunity to ask the Lord to bless the boys and girls of Junior Church before we dismiss them. So let's do that. Our Father, thank you for the children that you have blessed us with and brought to our fellowship this morning. Thank you for their families. Lord, thank you for the men and women who will care for them and teach them and uh, be with them in this next portion of the hour. We ask your blessing. We pray that precious truths of the Lord Jesus would be instilled in precious hearts. Thank you for the boys and girls. We commit them to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Boys and girls, you are dismissed. Now, if you would take your Bibles, please. We have arrived at the point in our study of the book of Acts at chapter 19. So you're turning to chapter 19 so that we get a little bit of perspective, not much time in introduction. Chapter 19 is in the midst of the third missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. By the time we reach chapter 19 and Paul's ministry in Ephesus, which becomes a place with a great church and a beautiful letter written to them, the book of Ephesians, letter to the Ephesians. But in Ephesus, Paul stays and ministers for several years. At this time, the church of Jesus Christ, born on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, is now approximately 20 years old. As we read through the book of Acts and see the things that transpire as we go through the first eight to 10 chapters and see ministry primarily to Jews, and then we see the transformation as they go to the Samaritans, the home of Cornelius and to Gentiles. We fail sometimes to realize that 20 years of history has passed. When we look back in the early chapters and find a fellow by the name of Saul of Tarsus who has permission that he has requested and secured to go to Damascus that if he could find any of the way followers of Jesus 
that he could arrest them, that he could bind them and bring them in chains back to Jerusalem for trial, for imprisonment, for death. That Saul of Tarsus, a young rabbi, by the time we get to chapter 20, is probably about 54, 55 years of age. There's a lot of time that's gone by in the few brief historical details that we've had to look at here in the book of Acts. It's a wonderful book written by Dr. Luke and Luke is recording for us the history of the early church and the acts of the apostles and how the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ began even on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem to a Jewish crowd and then extended to the rest of the world. And so some 20 years later, here we are in Acts chapter 19 where the apostle Paul is about to arrive in Ephesus and have a wonderful ministry. He's been there before. He's met Aquila and Priscilla here. He has been replaced, so to speak, in his absence by a guy by the name of Apollos. But now he's coming back for a lengthy ministry in Ephesus. So look with me at Acts chapter 19. By the way, I've divided this chapter into three points with 48 sub points. <laughs> three points. The first part of it, the first 10 verses, is the message. And then it's the miracles that accompany the message. And then it's the mob's response to the message. And this is not the Italian mob or the New York mob. This is a mob of Jews. So the message, the miracles, and the mob. And if we get to the mob, I will be surprised. All right, here we go. First, the message, and the message is in several parts. It begins to the followers of John, and it begins with a spiritual conversation. Look at verse 1. It happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. Here he is, arriving in the town of Ephesus, about 225,000 people in Ephesus at this time. And finding some disciples. What does it mean for someone to be called a disciple? A learner, a follower. It does not say finding disciples of Jesus. He finds here, I think it's 12 Jewish men who are disciples, followers of a dead leader, John the Baptist. So here's what it says. Finding some disciples, he said to them, verse 2, <clears throat> did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Did you receive the gift of God's Holy Spirit? Has he come in your life? Does he live with you? Is God present with you in the form of his Holy Spirit? You believed in something. Did you receive the Holy Spirit? And their response, they said to him, we haven't even so much as heard that there is a Holy Spirit. We know nothing of this. And so Paul says to them, into what then were you baptized? Baptized? See, baptism wasn't just for Christians. People got baptized to show their association with someone or something. Baptism is not brand new when we become followers of Jesus. That's not the first instance of baptism. Baptism was a regular event for different things. And so he says, you were baptized. Into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Wow. Paul gets to Ephesus, he meets these dozen men, he engages them in this great conversation and with Paul it very quickly comes around to where do you stand spiritually in relation to Jesus Christ and he begins talking to them to find out about this and they say, no, we, we don't know anything about the Holy Spirit, we certain ha certainly haven't received him. Now there's a lot of controversy over this verse. I would go to Romans chapter 8 and verse 9 which says, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, 
He is not his. The moment a believer trusts Christ today, he receives the Spirit of God. Now remember, the book of Acts is a transition time from Old Testament into New, from the things that were in Judaism to the things that are in Jesus Christ. And so these people say, oh, no, we don't know anything about the Holy Spirit. Paul has this spiritual conversation. And then, this is delightful. There's a spontaneous conversion. At that very moment, people, 12 men, say, I need what you're talking about. Wouldn't it be wonderful if every person today who heard the truth of the message of Jesus Christ, this good news we call the gospel, if they responded and say, no hesitation, no delay, today's the day, I must trust Christ Without him, I'm not saved. Without him, I face eternity lost. I want Christ. That was the response of these three guys. Look at verse 4. Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance. What does that mean? Well, that's what John did. Repent and be baptized. Repent of what? Well, John's baptism meant this. I am repentant. I submit to this baptism it's a public profession of my expectation that one day a Messiah will come. I repent of my sins in preparation for this coming Messiah. But Christian baptism says, I look back on the fact that the Messiah came. That the God of heaven who created the heavens and the earth has sent a savior for sinful mankind and that God of heaven I have received and my Christian baptism is a public statement of my personal experience. John's baptism, I have a personal expectation. Christian baptism, Christ is my personal experience. He's mine, he dwells within me. John baptized with a baptism of repentance, verse 4, saying to the people they should believe on the one who would come after him. And then Paul says this to them, and I want you to know that one who should come after John is Jesus Christ. And he immediately takes these disciples of John and points them, as he always does with everybody, to Christ. Verse 5 says, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, I believe they became believers in Jesus Christ and were immediately baptized. When they heard it, they became baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. I think that's a spontaneous conversion. Praise the Lord for that. There's one more. There's a special confirmation of their salvation, that Christ has come into their lives and they are saved. Look at verse 6. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied, and those men were about 12 in number or in all. What does it mean Paul laid hands on them? We don't know. Does it mean a formality? Does, laying hands on somebody can mean a whole lot of things, right? You say the wrong thing, somebody in your house lays hands on you, it's not that spiritual correct? Not that that ever happens, but how do we view this particular extraordinary incident that's here in Acts 19 verse 6? Well, this parallels, this passage parallels the experience of the Jews at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon them and cloven tongues like as of fire, and they spoke, and they spoke in languages that they had not learned but were given from God at Pentecost. It parallels what took place when Samaritans believed, and we can find that in the book of Acts. It parallels what took place when Gentiles in the house of Cornelius believed. In fact, in that incident in the hosts of Cornelius, the Holy Spirit came upon them without them being baptized simply when they believed. And after this event here in chapter 19 and verse 6, 
There's no further reference to this happening again in the book of Acts. So it seems to be a confirmation of the genuine salvation of Jews, of Samaritans, of Gentiles, even of disciples of John. And there it is. When Paul laid his hand on these men, it could have been to greet them as brothers in Christ or to put his hand upon them in the baptism act. The Holy Spirit came upon them in similar fashion to Pentecost and those other places that I've already mentioned. In this book of Acts, the book of transition, documenting the age finished, the old covenant, and the new covenant in Christ Jesus, this history book describes what happened. This is what took place. Now we could downplay it, we could dismiss it, We could seek to duplicate it. All three reactions would be wrong. This is an act that is recorded in scripture. It is a fact. But I want you to notice this. That when they received the gift of the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues, it was not the central theme of their lives or of the book of Acts. It is something specific, unique, and wonderful that accompanied trusting Christ. The point of Luke's account is the faithful communication of the gospel to the ends of the world involved God coming into the lives of people who never to that point knew him. May he do so today. The followers of John received a great conversation, were immediately converted, and had a confirmation miracle take place. And then the story in Acts chapter 19 goes right from the followers of John to the followers of Judaism. Now look with me, please, at verse 8. The truth is declared to the Jews. Verse 8, Paul went into the synagogue and he spoke boldly for about three months. Wow, he got away with it longer there than he has previously, right? For three months he got to preach Christ in a Judaistic setting, even in the synagogue. How did that happen? Well, it doesn't specifically credit these people here at this point, but I think we need to recognize that Aquila and Priscilla have been in this community ministering and they've built some incredible bridges. It is wonderful for Paul the evangelist to show up, but there were some believers here doing groundwork that paved the road. Praise the Lord for the people who lived there, the people who ministered there faithfully. Paul comes in, there's a great harvest. For three months, he reasons with them, he persuades them concerning the things of the kingdom of God. Now, what's the kingdom of God? Well, it's pictured for us at creation when God says about Adam, let them have dominion, about man, let them have dominion. That speaks of a kingdom. That kingdom is ruined in Genesis chapter 3 by the fall of mankind. That kingdom is promised throughout the Old Testament. It's presented to Israel when Jesus arrives and they reject the king and the kingdom. And so it becomes very personal, inward, not outward, but oh, there's a day coming when Jesus Christ will reign for a thousand years and then his reign will go on forever. But there's a kingdom and that wonderful truth about the kingdom is being discussed in the Jewish synagogue in verse 8. And then verse 9 gives their reaction. And some, these are the hardcore Judaistic people of the, of the Jewish synagogue, some were hardened, hardened, and did not believe. Same word used there as was used of Pharaoh's hardened heart. It's a deliberate hardening, a, a decisive rejection in the face of convincing, even irrefutable evidence. I will not believe. What did Pharaoh see? 
How many miracles did Pharaoh witness? Pharaoh was in the very presence of the man that God used to perform God's miracles and Pharaoh still would not believe. He hardened his heart. And here it is that these saw, they heard, they were convinced, but they refused. John 3.36 says this, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe, that's the same word as this hardened refusal. He who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Who is the Son? He's Jesus Christ. And those who believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, who believe that he's the Savior who died for their sins and trust him, those people are recipients of incredible undeserved favor. It's called grace. That God would do that for you and me. Why? Only because he's a God of love, not because we're people who are lovely. And yet, if you refuse, if any person refuses, John 3.36 says, the wrath of God abides on him. In other words, you can't be a friend of God without being a friend of Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life, but no man will come to the Father unless he comes through me. God's wrath abides on those who do not believe on Jesus Christ. They express their unbelief. And then verse 9 says this, and they spoke evil of the way of Jesus before the multitude. Not only did they make a decision to reject the gospel, but they began to curse this Jesus of Nazareth and the people who followed him. So Paul came into Ephesus, he spoke to the followers of John, he spoke to the followers of Judaism, and then he speaks to the Gentiles. First, uh, verse 9, second part says, so he, Paul, he departed from the synagogue, from the Jews, he withdrew the disciples, and he began to reason daily in the school of Tyrannus. Now, we don't know anything about Tyrannus. He's a teacher. He has a school. Is he a religious teacher? We don't know. His name, Tyrannus, means tyrant. What kind of a guy he was, whether this was his real name or a nickname, we don't know. But typical of this culture and this climate They would have class in the morning and class in the evening and siesta in the middle of the day. So the older I get, the better it's looking. And from 11 o'clock to somewhere between two and four, the school is empty. So because the facility was there and it was open to him, Paul would do his tent making early in the morning. Remember that was the occupation by which he supported himself. And then somewhere in the middle of the day between 11 and let's say 2 in that three hour period, he would teach or the phrase here is reason with the people for how long? Verse 10. And this continued for two years. He's already been at least three months in the synagogue. Before that, he's been in Ephesus. So he's got two and a half years of history in this town. Think of it, for two years, he teaches in the middle of the day, every single day. How about we try that? Can you imagine? Church for two or three hours a day, every single day. As wonderful as that may be, I'd die. (laughs) How did he do it? Do you know we don't really have a record of any one single majestic, stupendous address. We just see his faithful continuing ministry 
day after day after day? Did he get a massive crowd? How many people came to listen? Were Mondays the best day or the worst day? Were Fridays the worst day or the best day? When did it all take place? And life goes on day after day after day for two years. Look what verse 10 says. The result was so all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Oh, one little spoonful every single day brought out a tremendous amount of results so that the faithful ministry affected that entire part of the world. And at Ephesus, a thriving evangelistic church was established and the whole area was evangelized for Christ with much fruit. And that's the first point of three, the message. Second point, what is it? Anybody remember? The miracles, the miracles. Come with me to verse 11. First, there's special miracles. Special miracles. These are unique, uh, not repeated elsewhere. Misunderstood, and I've learned some things here that I never knew before. Verse 11. Now, God worked special or unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. So that even handkerchiefs, how do you say that? Handkerchiefs, handkerchiefs, those things, or aprons were brought from his body to the sick. Let's stop there for a moment. Now remember that the writer of the book of Acts is Dr. Luke. And Dr. Luke, the great physician, uses a medical term here when he says these handkerchiefs and aprons in verse 12 were brought from Paul's body. The word body that he uses is a medical term referring to the skin. So what? It's the only part of the body we see, right? Okay. Skin. The handkerchief, as it's translated in my New King James English, from the original word, we get napkin or cloth for the skin. In John eleven forty four, in John 20, verse 7, in Luke 19, 20, it's a napkin or cloth that's placed over the face of a dead person to hide their face. So when Jesus was resurrected, they passed through the grave, grave clothes and there was the napkin that was over his face folded in a di different place. It's a napkin from the skin, a napkin. Do you know what it means? It's a sweat rag. You're, you're working on the engine of your old Ford. I was gonna say Dodge, but Danny's sitting over here, so I'll say Ford. You're working on the engine of your old Ford. You get grease all over your hands. It's a hot day and the bugs are bad and the sun's shining. The sweat's coming down your neck and you're filthy dirty. You're running your power saw. You're putting your needle and thread through the cloth, making your tent and sweat's in your eyes and you keep grabbing that rag and you're wiping your face and so on. And then you get the bright idea of the first do-rag and you tie it around your head to stop the sweat from going down. That's the sweat cloth of the face. And the apron is not the apron that your grandmother wore in the kitchen. The apron is a cloth that's next to the skin at the waist that can be pulled out and wipe your dirty hands or to stop the sweat that's running down. That gives a whole new meaning to this, doesn't it? I can remember as a kid being in the home of a person I knew very well and that person had sent money to a TV religious figure and the TV religious figure for a certain amount of dollars would send a handkerchief that he had prayed over back to the person who sent the money and requested it 
so that in this case, that prayed over handkerchief could be put on his wife's ulcered legs, the skin of her legs broken open and hoping that it would bring healing. I don't know that anybody would spend money for dirty sweat cloth, right? I don't know if Paul started sending these out or if people just started hanging around waiting till he dropped one. But this sweat cloth is a special miracle because in verse 12 it says handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick. It covered distance. And when it got there it says the diseases left them. It covered disease. And then it says and evil spirits departed from them. It covered demons. Now let's understand quickly. The cloth was a piece of garbage. It was the blessing of God in a unique way at this time that went on the cloth, with the cloth. The cloth itself was nothing. It was God. God at work in a very special way. Special miracles. And then some people decided, we got to do the same thing. We can make money on this. So there's some sham miracles. Sham miracles. First, the deceivers in verse 13. Some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists. This is something they did. They traveled around doing this. They made money. This was a job. And these itinerant ex- uh, Jewish exorcists experienced in the art of exorcism or exercising demons, they decided it was a good idea and took it upon themselves to call over or to use the name of the Lord Jesus. They saw the miracle of this cloth coming from the preacher of Jesus and what it did, and they decided, we're going to give that a try. So they called the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exercise you by the Jesus that Paul preaches. That's kind of a roundabout thing, isn't it? The Jesus that Paul preaches, because we don't preach him and we don't know him, but he works pretty good for Paul, so we're going to get in on the action. And there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish priest, who did so. Seven young men who were Jewish itinerant exorcists, who had experience, who had done this before, but now decided... We're going to call the name of Jesus in for some extra oomph in our business. Hmm. Not very long ago in North America, we were kind of skeptical about the existence of demons. We kind of dismissed that thought. But today we're faced with an unprecedented occult invasion. Demonic activity is everywhere, it is offered, it is invited, there is witchcraft, there are so many things happening. In Ephesus, demonic activity was prevalent, it was practiced, it was good, productive business. And much to the annoyance of the Jewish rabbis, these Jewish exorcists tried to enhance their practice, their reputation, their results by using the all-powerful name of Jesus. They were deceivers. These are sham miracles. Under these sham miracles, there's a demon. Verse 15 tells us what the demon said. The evil demon, the spirit, spoke to the exorcists and said, you don't know Jesus, but I do. Oh, I'm not his follower. I'm not in favor. He doesn't love me, I don't love him. But I am well aware of who Jesus is. This was not news to the demons. In fact, the New Testament tells us that the demons believe and tremble in fear, but they're not followers by any means. Jesus I know. Then he said, secondly, Paul I know. I know this guy who's had such an incredible impact upon people. And he has been able to, by the power of God, heal diseases 
and cast out demons. I know who Jesus is. I know who Paul is. But you seven, you are nothing to me. I do not know you. And then verse 16 says this. And then the one possessed, the man in whom the evil spirit was, leaped on those seven guys, overpowered them, prevailed against them, and terrified they fled out of the house, wounded and naked. Let me encourage you. Have nothing to do with demonic activity. Don't mess with anything of the occult. You are instantly in over your head with something that's very real. Stay completely clear of it. By the way, when you go through the works of the flesh in Ephesians, the letter Paul wrote to this church group, chapter 5, it says pharmakia, drugs in there. They use drugs to get people to hallucinate, to be more open to the occult. Stay away from the occult, including any illicit use of drugs. It's not fun. It's not innocent. You're in over your head. You're playing with fire. Don't go there. So there were special miracles. There were sham miracles. And then there were wonderful spiritual miracles. Look at verse 18, and we'll conclude here. And many who had believed, believed what? Believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. They came forward in some way, confessing and telling their deeds. Oh, when do we ever practice that? I'm forgiven. I'm a sinner who's trusted Christ, but I don't want to share my sins with you. I don't want to tell you what I'm guilty of. I don't want in any way to let you know how I failed in the past week, simply that God has forgiven me. But these people came forward confessing, telling their deeds. In fact, a group of them who practiced magic brought the books that they had purchased to help them in their magic practice and they put that book, those books in a pile and they burned them in the sight of everybody and they counted up the value of those books and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. To get a little perspective, one man thought he was rich when he show, sold Jesus for 30 pieces. He evaluated Jesus Christ as worthy of 30 pieces of silver and sold him. These books are worth 50,000 pieces of silver. And they decide they're done with them and they sell them to someone else who can use them to recoup a little money. No. We're done. And they burn this. And verse 20 says this, the word of God, the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. What a wonderful thing. Satan had a tight grip on this city. The Ephesian people were delving into and meddling into the black arts, magic, sorcery. We remember that Satan's plan is to to give a resurgence of witchcraft, of spiritism, of Satanism, of astrology, of demonology. And God has expressly told us not to tamper with those things. And then the word of God comes in and sets men free. Isn't that great? Sets them free. And if we had time to go through the rest of the story, we would get to the mob which says, the city was so changed that people stopped buying all the silver shrines of Diana. And the craftsmen lost their lucrative income. And when you touch the wallet, you've gotten awful close to the heart. So they grab some people and they go into the theater and they begin to chant. And the town clerk comes in and dismisses the whole thing. What's going on? The word of God is having an impact in that whole area. And people are coming to Christ. Rob, Rob said to me before the service, 
Ken, you've got three sermons here. I think he was fairly accurate. Four things to conclude with. Paul and the early church in Ephesus were on a mission for God. They had the good news, and the good news is for telling. It's worth taking it elsewhere, even in the face of opposition. They were on a mission. Do we have that sense of mission? That there's a world needing, waiting, needs to hear the life-changing news of Christ. And I have it. You have it. We have that message. Number two, an obvious lesson. No matter how excellent the ministry, that it will meet exceptional opposition. If you try and live for Christ, you seriously try to live for Christ, you seriously try to serve Christ, there's a heavy price to pay for faithfulness. But that cost is nothing compared to the glory that awaits those who trust and obey the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you counted that cost? Number three, daily meetings for three years, I'm out. That's just ridiculous. Too much. How do you mow the lawn? How do you go fishing? How do you split the wood? I mean... All those days of faithful ministry added up so that people in the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the message. Don't be discouraged by the seeming insignificance of even one day's labor. Stay at it. Don't quit. And number four, the gospel in Ephesus was pretty much ignored until it touched the cash flow of the merchants. The ripple effect of the message of Jesus Christ will one day reach a lot further than we ever expected. Don't quit. Get involved in that ministry of sharing what you know and you have with those around you. Father, thank you for this precious passage. Thank you for the privilege of sharing from it we are absolutely, completely, I am absolutely and completely dependent upon you. Lord, bless our hearts with the word of God. Thank you for the message of Christ for any present or listening online to hear the message and reject and harden their hearts. Oh God, may they understand that your wrath is upon them. Even though we dislike that part and rarely speak of it, we love the love of God. The wrath of God is a biblical fact. Oh, Father, thank you for the Savior. His name is Jesus. May we trust in your Son this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing some more praises of truth to our Lord and Savior.
strong.